This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on March the 2nd, 2006. The Warden by Anthony Trollope Chapter 5 Dr. Grantly Visits the Hospital Though doubt and hesitation disturbed the rest of our poor warden, no such weakness perplexed the nobler breast of his son-in-law. As the indomitable cock, preparing for the combat, sharpens his spurs, shakes his feathers, and directs his comb, so did the archdeacon arrange his weapons for the coming war without misgiving and without fear. That he was fully confident of the justice of his cause let no one doubt. Many a man can fight his battle with good courage, but with a doubting conscience. Such was not the case with Dr. Grantly. He did not believe in the gospel with more assurance than when he did the sacred justice of all ecclesiastical revenues. When he put his shoulder to the wheel to defend the income of the present and future presenters of Barchester, he was animated by as strong a sense of the holy cause as that which gives courage to a missionary in Africa, or enables a sister of mercy to give up the pleasures of the world for the wards of a hospital. He was about to defend the holy of holies from the touch of the profane, to guard the citadel of his church from the most rampant of its enemies, to put on his good armor in the best of fights, and secure, if possible, the comforts of his creed for coming generations of ecclesiastical dignitaries. Such a work required no ordinary vigor, and the archdeacon was, therefore, extraordinarily vigorous. It demanded a buoyant courage, and a heart happy in its toil, and the archdeacon's heart was happy, and his courage was buoyant. He knew that he would not be able to animate his father-in-law with feelings like his own, but this did not much disturb him. He preferred to bear the brunt of the battle alone, and did not doubt that the warden would resign himself into his hands with passive submission. "'Well, Mr. Chadwick,' he said, walking into the steward's office a day or two after the signing of the petition, as commemorated in the last chapter, "'anything from Cox and Cummings this morning?' Mr. Chadwick handed him a letter, which he read, stroking the tight gaitered calf of his right leg as he did so. Messrs. Cox and Cummins merely said that they had as yet received no notice from their adversaries, that they could recommend no preliminary steps, but that should any proceeding really be taken by the bedesman, it would be expedient to consult the very eminent Queen's Counsel, Sir Abraham Haphazard. "'I quite agree with them,' said Dr. Grantly, refolding the letter. "'I perfectly agree with them. "'Haphazard is no doubt the best man, a thorough churchman, a sound conservative, "'and in every respect the best man we could get. "'He's in the house, too, which is a great thing.' "'Mr. Chadwick quite agreed. "'You remember how he put down the scoundrel horseman about the Bishop of Beverley's income? "'How completely he set them all adrift in the Earl's case?' Since the question of St. Cross has been mooted by the public, one noble lord has become the earl par excellence in the doctor's estimation. How he silenced that fellow at Rochester! Of course, we must have haphazard. And I'll tell you what, Mr. Chadwick, we must take care to be in time, or the other party will forestall us. With all his admiration for Sir Abraham, the doctor seemed to think it not impossible that the great man might be induced to lend his gigantic powers to the side of the church's enemies. Having settled this point to his satisfaction, the doctor stepped down to the hospital to learn how matters were going on there, and as he walked across the hallowed close and looked up at the ravens who called with a particular reverence as he wended his way, he thought with increased acerbity of those whose impiety would venture to disturb the goodly grace of cathedral institutions. And who has not felt the same? We believe Mr. Horseman himself would relent, and the spirit of Sir Benjamin Hall give way were those great reformers to allow themselves to stroll by moonlight round the towers of some of our ancient churches. Who would not feel charity for a prebendary when walking through the quiet length of that long aisle at Winchester, looking at those decent houses, the trim grass plat, and feeling as one must the solemn, orderly comfort of the spot? Who could be hard upon a dean while wandering around the sweet close of Hereford, 
and owning that in that precinct, tone and color design and form, solemn tower and storied window, are all in unison, and all perfect. Who could lie basking in the cloisters of Salisbury, and gaze on Jules' library and that unequaled spire, without feeling that bishops should sometimes be rich? The tone of our archdeacon's mind must not astonish us. It has been the growth of centuries of church ascendancy, and though some fungi now disfigure the tree, though there be much dead wood, for how much good fruit have not we to be thankful? Who without remorse can batter down the dead branches of an old oak, now useless, but, ah, still so beautiful, or drag out the fragments of the ancient forest, without feeling that they sheltered the younger plants, to which they are now summoned to give way, in a tone so peremptory and so harsh. The archdeacon, with all his virtues, was not a man of delicate feeling, and, after having made his morning salutations in the warden's drawing-room, he did not scruple to commence an attack on pestilent John Bold in the presence of Miss Harding, though he rightly guessed that the lady was not indifferent to the name of his enemy. "'Nelly, my dear, fetch me my spectacles from the back room,' said her father, anxious to save both her blushes and her feelings." Eleanor brought the spectacles, while her father was trying, in ambiguous phrases, to explain to her too practical brother-in-law that it might be as well not to say anything about Bold before her, and then retreated. Nothing had been explained to her about Bold and the hospital, but with a woman's instinct she knew that things were going wrong. "'We must soon be doing something,' commenced the archdeacon, wiping his brows with a large bright-colored handkerchief, for he had felt busy and had walked quick, and it was a broiling summer's day. "'Of course, you have heard of the petition?' Mr. Harding owned somewhat unwillingly that he had heard of it. "'Well,' the archdeacon looked for some expressions of opinion, but none coming, he continued, "'we must be doing something, you know. We mustn't allow these people to cut the ground from under us while we sit looking on.' The archdeacon, who was a practical man, allowed himself the use of everyday expressive modes of speech when among his closest intimates, though no one could soar to a more intricate labyrinth of refined phraseology when the church was the subject, and his lower brethren were his auditors. The warden still looked mutely in his face, making the slightest possible passes with an imaginary fiddle-bow, and stopping, as he did so, sundry imagining strings with his fingers of the other hand. "'Twas his constant consolation in conversational troubles. While these vexed him sorely, the passes would be short and slow, and the upper hand would not be seen to work. Nay, the strings on which it operated would sometimes lie concealed in the musician's pocket, and the instrument on which he played would be beneath his chair, but his spirit warmed the subject, as his trusting heart, looking to the bottom of that which vexed him, would see its clear way out. He would rise to a higher melody, sweep the unseen strings with a bolder hand, and swiftly fingering the chords from his neck down along his waistcoat and up again to his very ear, create an ecstatic strain of perfect music, audible to himself and to St. Cecilia, and not without effect. "'I quite agree with Cox and Cummins,' continued the archdeacon. "'They say we must secure Sir Abraham haphazard, and I shall not have the slightest fear in leaving the case in Sir Abraham's hands.' The warden played the slowest and saddest of tunes. It was but a dirge on one string.' I think Sir Abraham will not be long in letting Master Bold know what he is about. I fancy I hear Sir Abraham cross-questioning him at the common pleas. The warden thought of his income being thus discussed, his modest life, his daily habits, and his easy work, and nothing issued from that single cord but a low wail of sorrow. I suppose they've sent this petition up to my father. The warden didn't know. He imagined they would do so this very day. "'What I can't understand is how you let them do it with such a command as you have in the place, or should have with such a man as Bunce. I cannot understand why you let them do it.' "'Do what?' asked the warden. "'Why, listen to this fellow bold, and that other low pettifogger Finney, and get up this petition, too. Why didn't you just tell Bunce to destroy the petition?' "'That would have been hardly wise,' said the warden. "'Wise, yes.' It would have been very wise if they had done it among themselves. 
I must go up to the palace and answer it now, I suppose. It's a very short answer that they'll get, I can tell you. But why shouldn't they petition, doctor? Why shouldn't they? responded the archdeacon in a loud, brazen voice, as though all the men in the hospital were expected to hear him through the walls. Why shouldn't they? I'll let them know why they shouldn't, by the by, warden. I'd like to say a few words to them altogether. The warden's mind misgave him, and even for a moment he forgot to play. He by no means wished to delegate to his son-in-law his place and authority of warden. He had expressly determined not to interfere in any step which the men might wish to take in the matter under dispute. He was most anxious neither to accuse them nor to defend himself. All these things he was aware the archdeacon would do in his behalf, and that not in the mildest manner, and yet he knew not how to refuse the permission requested. "'I'd so much sooner remain quiet in the matter,' said he in an apologetic voice. "'Quiet,' said the archdeacon, still speaking with his brazen trumpet. "'Do you wish to be ruined in quiet?' "'Why, if I am to be ruined, certainly.' "'Nonsense, warden. I tell you something must be done. We must act. Just let me ring the bell and send the men word that I'll speak to them in the quad.' Mr. Harding knew not how to resist, and the disagreeable order was given. The quad, as it was familiarly called, was a small quadrangle open on one side to the river, and surrounded on the others by the high wall of Mr. Harding's garden, by one gable end of Mr. Harding's house, and by the end of the row of buildings which formed the residences of the bedesmen. It was flagged all around, and the center was stoned. Small stone gutters ran from the four corners of the square to a grating in the center, and attached to the end of Mr. Harding's house was a conduit, with four cocks covered over from the weather, at which the old men got their water, and very generally performed their morning toilet. It was a quiet, somber place, shaded over by the trees of the warden's garden. On the side toward the river there stood a row of stone seats on which the old men would sit and gaze at the little fish as they flitted by in the running stream. On the other side of the river was a rich green meadow running up to join the deanery, and as little open to the public as the garden of the dean itself. Nothing, therefore, could be more private than the quad of the hospital, and it was there that the archdeacon determined to convey to them his sense of their refractory proceedings. The servant soon brought in word that the men were assembled in the quad, and the archdeacon, big with his purpose, rose to address them. "'Well, warden, of course you're coming,' he said, seeing that Mr. Harding did not prepare to follow him. "'I wish you'd excuse me,' said Mr. Harding. "'For heaven's sake, don't let us have division in the camp,' replied the archdeacon. "'Let us have a long pull and a strong pull, but above all, pull all together. Come, warden, come. Don't be afraid of your duty.' Mr. Harding was afraid. He was afraid that he was being led to do that which was not his duty. He was not, however, strong enough to resist, so he got up and followed his son-in-law. The old men were assembled in groups in the quadrangle, eleven of them at least, for poor old Johnny Bell was bedridden and couldn't come. He had, however, put his mark to the petition as one of Handy's earliest followers. Tis true he could not move from the bed where he lay, tis true he had no friend on earth but those whom the hospital contained, and of those the warden and his daughter were the most constant and most appreciated. It is true that everything was administered to him which his failing body could require, or which his faint appetite could enjoy. But still his dull eye had glistened for a moment at the idea of possessing a hundred pounds a year to his own cheek, as Abel Handy had eloquently expressed it, and poor old Johnny Bell had greedily put his mark to the petition. When the two clergymen appeared, they all uncovered their heads. Handy was slow to do it, and hesitated. But the black coat and waistcoat of which he had spoken so irreverently in Sculpit's room had its effect even on him, and he too doffed his hat. Bunce, advancing before the others, bowed lowly to the archdeacon, and with affectionate reverence expressed his wish that the warden and Miss Eleanor were quite well. And the doctor's lady, he added, turning to the archdeacon, and the children at Plumstead and my lord, and having made his speech he also retired among the others, and took his place with the rest upon the stone benches. 
As the archdeacon stood up to make his speech, erect in the middle of that little square, he looked like an ecclesiastical statue placed there, as a fitting impersonation of the church militant here on earth, his shovel-hat large, new, and well-pronounced, a churchman's hat in every inch, declared the profession as plainly as does the Quaker's broad brim, his heavy eyebrows, large open eyes, and full mouth and chin expressed the stolidity of his order, his broad chest, amply covered covered with fine cloth, told how well-to-do was its estate. One hand ensconced within his pocket evinced the practical hold which our mother church keeps her temporal possessions, and the other, loose for action, was ready to fight, if need be, in her defence, and below these the decorous breeches and neat black gaiters, showing so admirably that well-turned leg, betokened the decency, the outward beauty and grace of our church establishment. "'Now, my men,' he began, when he had settled himself well in his position, "'I want to say a few words to you. Your good friend, the warden here, and myself, and the lord the bishop, in whose behalf I wish to speak to you, would all be very sorry, very sorry indeed, that you should have any just ground of complaint. Any just ground of complaint on your part would be removed at once by the warden, or by his lordship, or by me on his behalf, without the necessity of any petition on your part. Here the orator stopped for a moment, expecting that some little murmurs of applause would show that the weakest of the men were beginning to give way, but no such murmurs came. Bunce himself even sat with closed lips, mute and unsatisfactory. "'Without the necessity of any petition at all,' he repeated. "'I'm told you have addressed a petition to my lord.' He paused for a reply from the men, and after a while Handy picked up courage and said, "'Yes, we has.' You have addressed a petition to my lord, in which I am informed you express an opinion that you do not receive from Hiram's estate all that is your due. Here most of the men expressed their assent. Now, what is it that you ask for? What is it that you want that you haven't got here? What is it? A hundred a year, muttered old Moody, with a voice as if it came out of the ground. A hundred a year? ejaculated the archdeacon militant, defying the impudence of these claimants with one hand stretched out and closed, while in the other he tightly grasped and secured within his own breeches pocket that symbol of the church's wealth which his own loose half-crowns not unaptly represented. A hundred a year! Why, my men, you must be mad! And you talk about John Hiram's will. When John Hiram built a hospital for worn-out old men, worn-out old laboring men, infirm old men past their work, cripples, blind, bedridden, and such the like, do you think he meant to make gentlemen of them? Do you think John Hiram intended to give a hundred a year to old single men who earn perhaps two shillings or a half-crown a day for themselves and their families in the best of their time? No, my men. I'll tell you what John Hiram meant. He meant that twelve poor old worn-out laborers, men who could no longer support themselves, who had no friends to support them, who must starve and perish miserably if not protected by the hand of charity, he meant that twelve such men as these should come here in their poverty and wretchedness and find within these walls shelter and food before their death and a little leisure to make their peace with God. That was what John Hiram meant. If you have not read John Hiram's will, and I doubt whether those wicked men who are advising you have done so, I have. I know what his will was, and I tell you that was his will, and that was his indention. Not a sound came from the eleven bedesmen, as they sat listening to what, according to the archdeacon, was their intended estate. They grimly stared upon his burly figure, but did not then express by word or sign the anger and disgust to which such language was sure to give rise. "'Now, let me ask you,' he continued, "'do you think you are worse off than John Hiram intended to make you? Have you not shelter and food and leisure? Have you not much more?' Have you not every indulgence that you are capable of enjoying? Have you not twice better food, twice a better bed, ten times more money in your pocket than you were ever able to earn for yourselves before you were lucky enough to get into this place? And now you send a petition to the bishop asking for a hundred pounds a year? I tell you what, my friends, 
you are deluded, and made fools of by wicked men who are acting for their own ends, you will never get a hundred pence a year more than what you have now. It is very possible that you may get less, and it is very possible that my lord the bishop and your warden may make changes. No, 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 interrupted Mr. Harding, who had been listening with indescribable misery to the tirade of his son-in-law. No, my friends, I want no changes, at least no changes that will make you worse off than you are now as long as you and I live together. God bless you, Mr. Harding, said Bon Scott. "'Bless you, Mr. Harding. God bless you, sir. We know you as always our friend,' was exclaimed by enough of the men to make it appear that the sentiment was general. The archdeacon had been interrupted in his speech before he had quite finished it, but he felt that he could not recommence with dignity after this little ebullition, and he led the way back to the garden, followed by his father-in-law. "'Well,' said he, as soon as he had found himself within the cool retreat of the warden's garden, I think I spoke to them plainly, and he wiped the perspiration from his brow, for making a speech under a broiling midday sun in summer in a full suit of thick black cloth is warm work. Yes, you were plain enough, replied the warden, in a tone which did not express approbation. And that's everything, said the other, who was clearly well satisfied with himself. That's everything. With those sort of people one must be plain, or one will not be understood. Now, I think they did understand me. I think they knew what I meant. The warden agreed. He certainly thought they had understood to the full what had been said to them. They know pretty well what they have to expect from us. They know how we shall meet any refractory spirit on their part. They know that we are not afraid of them. And now I'll just step into Chadwick's and tell him what I've done, and then I'll go up to the palace and answer this petition of theirs. The warden's mind was very full, full nearly to overcharging itself, and had it done so, had he allowed himself to speak the thoughts which were working within him, he would indeed have astonished the archdeacon by the reprobation he would have expressed as to the proceeding of which he had been so unwilling a witness. But different feelings kept him silent. He was as yet afraid of differing from his son-in-law. He was anxious beyond measure to avoid even a semblance of rupture with any of his order, and was painfully fearful of having to come to an open quarrel with any person on any subject. His life had hitherto been so quiet, so free from strife, his little early troubles had required nothing but passive fortitude. His subsequent prosperity had never forced upon him any active cares, had never brought him into disagreeable contact with any one. He felt that he would give almost anything, much more than he knew he ought to do, to relieve himself from the storm which he feared was coming. It was so hard that the pleasant waters of the little stream should be disturbed and muddied by rough hands, that his quiet paths should be made a battlefield, that the unobtrusive corner of the world which had been allotted to him, as though by providence, should be invaded and desecrated, and all within it made miserable and unsound. Money he had none to give. The knack of putting guineas together had never belonged to him, but how willingly, with what a foolish easiness, with what happy alacrity he would have abandoned the half his income for all time to come, could he by doing so have quietly dispelled the clouds that were gathering over him, could have thus compromised the matter between the reformer and the conservative, between his possible son-in-law, Bold, and his positive son-in-law, the archdeacon. And this compromise would not have been made from any prudential motive of saving what would yet remain, for Mr. Harding still felt little doubt but he should be left for life in quiet possession of the good things he had, if he chose to retain them. No, he would have done so from the sheer love of quiet, and from a horror of being made the subject of public talk. He had very often been moved to pity, to that inward weeping of the heart for others' woes, but none had ever pitied more than the old lord, whose almost fabulous wealth, drawn from his church preferments, had become the subject of so much opprobrium, of such public scorn, that wretched clerical octogenarian Croesus, whom men would not allow to die in peace, whom all the world united to decry and to abhor, was he to suffer such a fate? 
Was his humble name to be bandied in men's mouths as the gormandizer of the resources of the poor, as of one who had filched from the charity of other ages wealth which had been intended to relieve the old and the infirm? Was he to be gibbeted in the press, to become a byword for oppression, to be named as an example of the greed of the English church? Should it ever be said that he had robbed those old men whom he had so truly and so tenderly loved in his heart of hearts? As he slowly paced hour after hour under those noble lime trees, turning these sad thoughts within him, he became all but fixed in his resolve that some great step must be taken to relieve him from the risk of so terrible a fate. In the meanwhile, the archdeacon, with contented mind and unruffled spirit, went about his business. He said a word or two to Mr. Chadwick, and then, finding as he expected the petition lying in his father's library, he wrote a short answer to the men, in which he told them that they had no evils to redress, but rather great mercies for which to be thankful. And, having seen the bishop sign it, he got into his brougham and returned home to Mrs. Grantley and Plumstead Episcopi. So ends chapter 5.